Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa bhutang dhannang sankhang namasami This is the last uh, evening, tomorrow the finale of this retreat, and the, uh, you take the five precepts, The Buddha's uh, teaching of the Four Noble Truths, this, this is uh, the, the essential teaching of, of the Buddha. And this, these truths are, they each have, uh, one has an insight into each of these truths. There's, well, there's, there's three insights to each truth. But the, 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 it's based on the experience of suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the, and what is called the Eightfold Path, or the way of non-suffering. So that it uh, states the, the, make, it proclaims this, that there is suffering, there, this suffering is to be understood. So, Realize the significance of that, that suffering is something to understand, not to try to get rid of or run away from, but to be understood. So the, so the first truth reads to us, there is suffering, suffering is to be understood. The third insight is suffering has been understood. So this, so that this sequence follows for each of the noble truths. The statement, the, uh, what should be done and what, and then the realization or the result. And so this, this, uh, dukkha or what we cannot bear or what we think we cannot bear or just, uh, just whatever the, the state of mind of the body is, then we, when once we admit it into consciousness, that we, we, we say there is this suffering, then the insight is comes to us. It should be understood, and then we we understand. We go to it. We we observe it. We stand under it. And that's why don't be afraid to suffer. Be willing to suffer, not as a kind of to be a martyr or out of some uh, kind of neurotic need to to feel put upon but to to take an interest in it because there's suffering this realm that we're in is a realm where suffering is a very common experience to everyone then the second noble truth is there is a cause of suffering which is the uh, attachment to desire so in the, the cause of suffering is, 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 this is a very important and significant statement, is, is not desire, but attachment to desire. So that the desires we have when we attach to them, and that's the cause, the attachment of two things, is the, is the cause of suffering. So the insight is suffering should be let go of. So the prescription for the, the treatment is it should be let go of, to let go. And then you practice 
you, you when you have that insight of letting go, then you practice that, and then you have the third aspect of the second noble truth, which is suffering has been let go of. So letting go is the is is the the second noble truth. Something I used to talk a lot about letting go. I used to think it was one of Arjun Sumedho's discoveries, but it's not. <laughs> and, uh, it's Orthodox Buddhism <laughs> and the very the essential teaching of the Buddha to to let go of desire. And letting go is not getting rid of, throwing away, it's leaving things, let, allowing them to go. And that's why when we, un, when we talk about embracing suffering or, or fully accepting suffering or willing to suffer, then we're, we're, we're letting it go, we're allowing it to go because all things that come go. You're not, when, once you get into the, idea of you've got to get rid of it, then you're into another the attachment to another desire of wanting to get rid of something. So so remember that it's the letting go should one should let go of the cause of suffering, let go of desire, and then through that the realization that desire has been let go of. Remember that desire is the kind of great, uh, basic uh, sensual desires or the desire for becoming something, desire for getting rid of things. So this was quite a, I remember when I started contemplating desire in my practice, it was quite a revelation to see, to think in those three, to contemplate those three categories. Because I realized how like Whipple would done, our desire to get rid of things was such a strong habit of mine. And that it was thought it was a good thing to do, to, to get rid of bad things, or, you know, that you should get rid of things. Uh, and so that there was a, this Whipple would done, how then I could see was a, um, something that I was very attached to to controlling things, trying to get rid or avoid or get out of things. Anything that might bring suffering or threat of any kind. Then the third noble truth is there is the cessation of suffering. So the second noble truth is the arising, third noble truth is the cessation. Now letting go of desire then allows you to realize the cessation of desire. Allowing desire to go, since it's impermanent, then you realize that it ceases. Not there's a realization. Now, a realization is is reality. It's the real world. It's the the real thing. It's not it's not the the deluded world that you're all going back to tomorrow. The world of delusion. But the the realization is. Is, is reality, realizing the cessation. It's interesting, there's a, in uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, quartet, so that he, there's this quote called, uh, um, Man's curiosity searches past and future and clings to that dimension but to apprehend apprehend the intersection of the timeless with time is an occupation for the saint. No occupation either, but a lifetime's death in love, ardor, selflessness, and self-surrender. That's a poetic way of describing the third noble truth. <laughs> now the, to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time is, is what the noble, third noble truth is about. To see the, the, the cessation of, of the condition to the unconditioned. So the, the point of intersection of the timeless with time. 
these kind of expressions are you know this is this is this is a this is always going on but we don't see it we don't notice it because they in the say the ordinary life of a person one is just caught up in 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 the arising conditions of life and avoiding the the other side and then one is just kind of boredom and and any form of suffering or or uh, discomfort or pain or sickness or death or grief or whatever one tends to easily kind of just get rid of or dismiss or suppress get away from it so that the we, we don't see the cessation of things until we 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 we, we are patient and mindful because when we there's that nobody ever teaches us or tells us or suggests it. Except the Buddha did in his teaching of the Four Noble Truths, realization of the cessation. So there is a cessation of suffering. And then the inside is cessation should be realized. And then through the practice, one realizes cessation. So cessation has been realized. So... That is the realization of nibbana, or non-attachment, or emptiness, non-self. And that is always here and now. It's 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 the way it is. It's not it's not a kind of of uh, something that happens occasionally in the most rarefied circumstances. But it's it's quite ordinary. But it's so ordinary. It's it's one doesn't notice. One hasn't even developed the perceptions to notice it. It's not even a possibility in most people's lives. Because they, they don't even think about it or, or know about it or have any clues about it. With that uh, realization of the third noble truth then establishes right understanding, which is that the Eightfold Path is based on uh, right understanding or perfect understanding. So in the, the Fourth Noble Truth, which is the Eightfold Path, the, the insight from the first three truths, the suffering, its origin and cessation, then there's this perfect understanding of the way it is. It's a, but it's not like, it's not... It's not uh, fantastic or, or extreme. It's perfect understanding of, of just that simple pattern that seems insignificant or, or totally, or most people totally unrealized. We can only realize things on a very subtle and simple level as human beings. We're not God or something that can see the whole macrocosmic universe from, from the top. We have to learn from just the, the insignificance of our, seeming insignificance of our life. This little old me, nobody, with my thoughts and feelings, <laughs> the way I am, you know, just an ordinary guy, really, just uh, one human being in how many, 60 million people here in Britain, or 5.4 billion on the planet, just another, another human. But it's in this state of our humanity we learn, we can learn ultimate reality, we can realize ultimate reality. But it's in a very simple form, an insignificant form. It's not it's not macrocosmic and absolutely fantastic. So this is why we're, we, we can see it within our own minds when we're mindful. We can see it in very simple things, uh, and but yet the human human mind is usually conditioned to only notice things that are extreme. You know, see things on a, that that are really very noticeable or very uh, obvious, very exciting, very uh, unusual. Right understanding or perfect understanding, Samaditi, Samasangapo is the second, is the 
second fold of the eightfold, which is uh, translated as right intention or attitude. Because from that perfect perfect understanding, that perfect that, that, that understanding couldn't be more perfect. If it's perfect, you can't get better than perfect. <laughs> then the intention of the mind is 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 also perfect. You're intending. You're what what you're you know, like you're what you do, what you aim at, what you incline to. Then is 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 perfect. And so the then the uh, third is the uh, perfect speech. The fourth perfect action with perfect livelihood or usually translated as right I'm using perfect tonight so this means that the right perfect understanding perfect perfect intention then we that implies how we live our lives in in a physical way or verbal ways what we do with ourselves How we live our lives and with with the per, with speech because we speak we have to, we live in a society we talk to each other and action we have to live and make a living and and act upon things so we we do things with our bodies and we have to make make a living to support families or survive make money in order to buy food or whatever. So this is this right understanding takes us to this right way of living, or perfect way of living, which then, of course, is uh, the sixth, seventh, and eighth are perfect effort, perfect mindfulness, perfect concentration. So they have this. It's like the the right understanding or the perfect understanding is the wisdom faculty in the right or perfect speech perfect action perfect livelihood is the is the moral positioning and then the uh, perfect effort perfect mindfulness perfect concentration is the samadhi because when these these are integrated then your your heart your emotions are balanced perfect or sama samadhi uh, perfect concentration. It's not like you're it's not a concentration that blocks you off. It's a it's a full concentration of openness. It's not a concentration on something. It's a concentration that is open and receptive. So the, the there is this eightfold path. This path should be developed. So the the insight into cultivating or developing this way. So it's a, a lifetime's death in love, order, selflessness and self-surrender is the Eightfold Path. Lifetime's death. You're letting things die in you all the time. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're letting go of things. You're letting your personality and, and all the, the things that you, you identify as being you and alive, you're, you're letting them die in you. It's a lifetime's dying in love, ardor, selflessness and self-surrender. I don't know if T.S. Eliot would agree with my... But that's how I, I interpret it. The... Um, This die before you die. Lung Po Cha used to talk about that. He said, "Die, be, die, go on die and die. Die is 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 die. In Thai, this is the same word. <laughs> they die, go on die, or they die before you die. And in uh, Shakespeare, they also he says, "And death once dead, there's no more dying then." then one of his sonnets, he uh, uses that uh, image. So in the in the 
in dying, say, this, this letting things go, letting them die. Sometimes you feel it. You feel, I remember going through periods where, where I was, uh, I felt I was dying. It was kind of frightening. Uh, because, uh, on the level of emotion, there, one felt terrified sometimes because you felt you're dying, I'm dying, and, 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 and this, uh, sense of death was, was frightening, and there was a desire to live, I want to live, I want to, you know, be alive, and the emotions would, would, would really be quite reactive in that way. But if you don't get fooled by that, don't, uh, don't get, get taken over by your emotions, then you let them, you let them go and they die. And what remains after death is peace, calm, clarity, purity. And you, 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 begin, you, you realize the true nature of things, the deathless reality, which isn't Trying to, to stay alive, or trying to—it's not hysterical. It's not. It's not. It's not fear-ridden. Not uh, anything uh, uh, that the that these death-bound conditions that we identify with are are delusions, and and they and that's why we when we when we identify with death, usually people think they're identifying with life, but they're identifying with death. For example, if you. If you think you are your body, what's your body? Where is it taking you? Into the in crematorium. And that all of us in hundred years, maybe none of us will all be disappeared. Burned in the crematorium or buried in the ground or fed to the vultures or thrown into the sea or whatever. <laughs> All these bodies. So, so the, the, the attachment to the body is an attachment to death. And yet we can see it as attachment to life. But it's, that's how deluded we are about it. When you contemplate it, you see that, that, it, that your identity with your physical body is, is an identity with death, not with life. Or say your, just your emotional nature, which is, which can, you know, be very strong and, Emotions like always have, a, you know, such kind of urgent quality and kind of overwhelming quality to them sometimes. And the emotions, but they can change. They can, you can, you can feel high one minute and depressed the next. Manic depressive. You can just go manic and then the next minute you can go down into the depths of despair. Emotions are, they can be screaming, say, this is important. And then the next minute it, you can, your mind can be filled with some totally trivial, foolish thing. Then, uh, because emotions are, are like that. They just kind of all over the place and they, they have no, they're not stable until there is a samadhi of, or a, a, a balance of emotion, an equanimity. But not when you're caught in the kind of ups and downs and highs and lows of, of a feeling life and reacting to life. So we let those die. The death once dead, there's no more dying. We let everything die before we die. And Lung Po Chow used to say that. He said, he'd say to people, sometimes the Westerners that would come to the monastery, they'd say, did you come here to die? <laughs> there's always a bit of a shock. They didn't quite know what he meant by that. He said, no, of course not. He came here to get enlightened, to <laughs> practice meditation, to improve my life or whatever. But, but he, he would like to say things that kind of were true in, in really direct questions, but which also were a bit shocking, really startling to hear. Did you come here to die? In the practice, then, when we see, like in daily life practice, when you, when you, say, go home and return to the the ordinary life, 
these are good images to reflect upon and to to not not to you know not to uh, make problems about your daily life, but to to be more open to what you're actually doing and and uh, to to observe the, the kind of force of habit, not not as a criticism, but a more willingness to watch yourself and and observe rather than criticize. No need to go to get all critical about how you should be more mindful and you should be less selfish and you should do this and do that and, uh, because we we have that we always got this kind of inner tyrant always nagging away anyway telling you you're not good enough you should be doing something so uh, I, most of us I'm sure have we're not going to you know our problems lie in often in in that we have we have such a strong will and 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 a kind of obsessive tendency to do things and a, and a very and and standards and ideas that w- that make us very critical of things of life so we we begin to to make the determination to just watch and be more aware of of this to really not be afraid of feeling life, but to admit feeling, to to notice it, to contemplate it, and to to just observe how you live your life. Not to, to in order to understand yourself and and the way of letting things die, and not just always uh, say running around trying to to be caught up into into things that are arising. We're trying to be reborn again in some some new interesting thing, some new relationship or some new profession or some interesting hobby or go on interesting adventure. Make life interesting. Because inter- wanting life to be interesting is is the desire, isn't it, to always have something interesting to distract you because you can't take boredom. Boredom you're just averse to and and you, you feel dead or you feel your life is worthless or you know, unless you're making it really interesting. So, we, you know, in, in the modern, with modern technology, I, I read about all these kind of, these, uh, kind of things that they have now which is called virtual reality amazing what more kind of deluded pretenses to distract your mind <laughs> they all sound very you know tempting and attractive you know to be able to connect yourself up to a machine and kind of go into Fantastic state of uh, that seems real. I mean, it's uh, but that's how, how our society. That's the aim of our society, isn't it? It's like that. It always is trying to increase the delusions, make them more convincing, more totally absorbing. It's interesting to see people coming here for for a ten day retreat, uh, giving up your virtual reality equipment <laughs> to sit here and pain and <laughs> this is a, there's hope for us because. <laughs> Because you can see something in us doesn't really want that, do we? I mean, it, it, we don't want to live in a, a world of delusion, even though it might be interesting and kind of mesmerizing. But basically, when it stops, then you you feel totally kind of stupid and empty, and and not empty in a in, as in a, uh, through realization, but a kind of like a meaningless, purposeless. Life, just to seek pleasure through your body and senses, uh, it makes life worthless. 
you're just trying to use your body or the senses and the, the mind just for pleasure seeking and distraction at the end of the day you're left hating yourself and feeling uh, that life is uh, just totally meaningless and become suicidal and it's interesting to see how how sitting like this learning to concentrate the mind develop in a skillful way how and how we begin to to develop something a, a, an intuitive sense an inner sense that and develop that uh, which is which is getting taking us beyond just the the personality we have or the or the uh, assumptions we make in, about ourselves and the world we live in we're tuning in to the deathless to the Amata Dhamma, to immortality, to ultimate reality. Where the other is just distraction, a death, death bound distraction. Dying before you die, then, is when you're seeing, when you're allowing things to cease in your in you in your mind. Sometimes you do you do have a feeling of death, of something of lo- of loss or death or even grief. But if you bear that, and uh, then it takes you to peace. And in Thailand, when when somebody dies, the people usually call the monks and you chant this very short Pali chant, which goes. Anicca vada sankara ubattava yatamino ubacitava niruchanti de sangu basamo sukho. And this translates as Anicca vada sankara. All sankharas, all conditions are impermanent. They arise and they pass away. And in their passing is peace. And so this is, this is what every Buddhist in Thailand, when somebody dies and they, the monks are brought in and you chant, Anicca vada sankara but when you contemplate the, the corpse, the dead body. And and you're saying to and you're and you're reflecting on it. This is what happens. All conditions are impermanent. You you're noting. Here's somebody you know, people are grief uh, stricken, their maybe their mother died or something and they're they're feeling sorrow. And you're and you're reflecting, all conditions are impermanent. What arises passes away, and in the passing is peace. So, this this is a a very beautiful reflection when somebody dies. I remember in the, uh, in the in when I went to uh, Christian funerals, they don't they don't reflect like that. And my mother died. Uh, father died. They were. They were uh, Funerals were in the Roman Catholic Church, and uh, they had they had they were quite nice funerals actually. But it was it wasn't reflecting on Dhamma or what had actually taken place. It was like saying uh, a kind of like eulogies about how wonderful they were, and now they're uh, up in heaven with the Lord, and this kind of thing, which was quite inspiring to the mind. You kind of you know you in, inspired the mind with with beautiful ideas. It's nice to think of your mother now up in some heavenly state with God. And, you know, that's what she wanted. She was di- dying to die. She wanted to go and up and live with God in, the he- in heavenly bliss forever. And so it's nice to to think of that. That's inspiring the mind, isn't it? But it's not really, it's not contemplating the way it is now in the present. And so... And, and, and I noticed this. We didn't in these funerals, Christian funerals. We didn't weren't contemplating what actually happened. We were trying to avoid mentioning it, and uh, and talk about things like how wonderful they were, and uh, and then how we will miss them, and how that but now they're up in heaven, and with eternal happiness. 
But uh, and we they they didn't open the coffin. You didn't look at the body or anything. You weren't willing. To, there was no kind of effort to bring attention to what what that that we that what death really is. We don't like death is something that we're all going to experience, but we don't know what it is because we're alive. And we're we're now experiencing life. In the in a in a conscious form, death of the body is uh, is in the future for us, isn't it? Right now, say when you think of death, the subject of death comes in your mind. You know that's going to happen in the future. The death of your body. I hope it's not going to happen right now, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the but to, to die before you die is to observe the ending of things in your mind, of the desires and fears and uh, that, 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 that arise, that uh, come up in your consciousness and then you can let them, allow them to go. They, they cease. And that's, just, that's death. That's die before you die. So in the, the cessation, like Third Noble Truth, realize it's cessation. You're realizing that de- what death is. That it's just the ending of something that began. That's all. It's not. It's not any more than that. It's just the begin, the end of what began, or the death of what was born. And so, when you when you contemplate that and take it to to real insight, then you realize there's nothing to fear. That actually we don't we don't really die. Bodies die. Emotion sees. Uh, only things kind of that which begins ends. It's just the way things are. But we have, begin to have the intuition into deathless, into deathless reality, the ineffable, to be experienced individually by the wise. Bhajitang we ti da po we knew he in the chanting the reflections on Dhamma. So that's peace, isn't it? That's peace. It's not a it's not a void of blank nothingness, it's peace. And we, we realize the magic of it all, the the arising and ceasing of conditions in the, in the unconditioned. It's a kind of miracle. What is a miracle? Is when something arises out of nothing, isn't it? We think that's a miracle for us when something comes out of nothing, and yet that's what's happening all the time. And that things arise out of condition arises out of the unconditioned and ceases, and it's like it's all a miracle anyway. But but so that the we tend to be the ignorance of the human being is is our is our identity and assumptions we make about being the the things of life the the things that come and go because they're the obvious they're the that's what exists for us that's what we see this body's you know obvious thing and if we if we just keep to a gross kind of sensory uh, level of of perceiving things and and without reflecting and going deep into understanding, then of course we live our lives always in in the assumptions of I'm the body and I'm my feelings and and then the and that brings all the fears and anxieties of life which are around death and loss and humiliation and not getting what you want and getting diseases and feeling pain and and all the rest is just so much to worry and potential misery in this human state that uh, if if we don't if, if that's all we do is is get stuck in the in the identity with this with the conditions of body and mind then then that's the dukkha the first noble truth that's why humanity suffers and it here in Britain you see a lot of suffering among people who have everything. 
not like the unemployed or just the unemployed or the people in the Sudan starving to death. A lot of real misery exists in 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 very wealthy affluent homes, and it's and that's because of you know the, of that's the natural result of of ignorance, not understanding Dhamma. So, so having wealth and all the best that life has to offer isn't the answer. It isn't going to be satisfying to us. We used to maybe think it would. When you're poor, you think, you know, if I were rich, then I'd be really happy. <laughs> Then when you get rich, you find out you're <laughs> But it's, uh, but sometimes you have to, you know, poor people think that, uh, that we just say that because, or think that rich people say things like that because, uh, it's kind of, you know, to keep that, keep it all for themselves. And, and, and talk about the one, the, you know, the, Poverty or being poor is is all right, but I remember in India when I was in India in seventy four, the, the uh, I, I in those days there were a lot of the untouchable caste Hindus converting to Buddhism, and so in nineteen fifty six one of the great Indian leaders who was from the untouchable caste converted made a public conversion in India became a Buddhist and advised all the untouchable outcasts in people in, in the Hindu religion in India to become Buddhists. So since 1956, there's been these mass conversions. And so I was very sympathetic with all this. And, you know, as being a, a kind of character that I am, you're always kind of sympathetic for people, uh, for the underdog, for the, for the poor or the under priv- the ones without privileges, or the people that have been mistreated by life, it always, you know, reaches your heart. So I thought, well, maybe I can help these people. And uh, so I started going to things, getting involved with them in in India, and uh, and I realized I was getting really in a difficult situation because. These people were, they wanted, I mean they had, they'd been badly treated admittedly, but they were also, they wanted civil rights, they wanted equal opportunities, they wanted all the things that, let's say in America, you know, everybody has, but still people are miserable. (laughs) You know, so, you know, you I remember thinking, you know, they have, they have, we have all that, all those things, and uh, yet, so what? Still get depressed, want to commit suicide, and can't bear life. <laughs> so, uh, but then I saw that 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 maybe that's what they have to do. That's where they are. They need to try to get those things, and not to put that down. And it's good to have, you know, to move towards more fair uh, economic and political systems, not not knocking that. But I realized that, that I wasn't interested in that. And that, uh, because I already had it, so I was already, you know, that was, that was nothing that I was, uh, that I felt deprived of in my life. But what was really missing was, uh, you know, what I felt deprived in my life was uh, the the emptiness of it all, the meaninglessness of it, and so the the attraction to the medi- Buddhist meditation and uh, could really appreciate the four noble truths. When I talked about the four noble truths, of most of these people they didn't they weren't interested in suffering, not at all. I and mean, it was very political movements. In God, I was in those days, 1974. Americans were persona non grata in India because uh, Indira Gandhi was the 
prime minister and Richard Nixon was president of the United States and they hated each other and and Richard Nixon was selling uh, uh, kind of jet aircraft to Pakistan you know, war planes so so that that uh, you know you felt you felt quite vulnerable being an American traveling in India in 1974 and uh, and then I, I was I remember in, in uh, Kanpur the, the city industrial city of Kanpur I was there and I was asked to give a a talk a Dharma talk to some to these people and so I went and, and uh, there, were, there were thousands of them in a public park all waiting to hear me give words of wisdom they put me on a kind of platform with a loud speaker system and and, they, and this uh, Indian man was going to translate into Hindi so so I'd say a few words and and then and then this this Indian translator would go on for quite a long time <laughs> and he was very kind of dynamic and gesticulated and I get, you know, after you know a while you're going to wonder what he was saying and at the end of it at the end of this evening I found out that he had misrepresented me totally and had and was using me to put down the Hindus the Brahmins the Vedas the Upanishads I'd condemned it all <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be thrown out of this country. They think I'm, you know, uh, some kind of of uh, malevolent force or American CIA or some dreadful thing. And I was really quite frightened because I thought, you know, I'm here. I'm, you know, out of uh, good intention and innocence and naivety, I've got myself. You know, I could really be seen as a as a, an enemy. So then. Uh, they asked me to come the next night, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I said uh, when they came to get me, I said no, I'm not going. And they said why? And I said what you did to me the uh, last night was was despicable to treat a Buddhist monk like that, to to say that he's saying things that he's not saying, to to misuse a monk is a very is very demeritorious, very bad, very evil. And I really laid it on thick. <laughs> I said, I'm not going, I'm not, nothing more to do with you. And they were all quite disturbed and upset by it. So finally they said, well, if we get a different translator. And I said, yes. <laughs> so they, they brought somebody out. And uh, and I talked to this man first, and he seemed quite an honorable type person. So when, then, I, then I went back, and I tried to set them straight, you know, saying that... Uh, that the Buddha didn't teach uh, hatred of any sort, or was not the Buddhists were not against Hindus or Brahmins or anything like that. That were teaching, uh, and I tried to give this about the four noble truths. I don't, and the and the man, the translator, I'm sure was trying to give an accurate translation, but it, I don't think it was terribly inspiring to those people. <laughs> he has, uh, they were very much into you know, feeling uh, indignant about their how they've been treated and and uh, I mean that's a, quite a high, isn't it, to kind of feel angry about having been oppressed and having been treated badly and for for generations and centuries and so forth, and you can really make a strong case, emotional case of of, of indignation and anger and, and wanting to seek revenge. After that I was more careful I in my and I thought probably what I've learned would be more useful in countries like this <laughs> where people have all those things and real and still suffer, you know. It's true, isn't it, in the, the States or here in Western Europe and that uh, people are quite receptive to the Four Noble Truths. Because they, they, have, they aren't, we, have, we don't feel we, you know, that, that the next government is going to really make all that much difference. 
that the political system in Britain needs to be, that we need a new political system or we, we realize it's not really the political system that's wrong or the, it's, it's the, the lack of wisdom that, that is the missing factor. Like here in, in Europe or in Britain or in the States, it's not really the political institutions or the things. They seem to be all right in themselves. They would function quite well if they had wise human beings operating them. <laughs> I mean, so it's not a matter of, of trying to get the right a new government with a, with a new political ideal, but in developing wisdom in the human, in this human state, that then the, then the institutions we have will work much better. The democratic institutions, things like parliamentary government and all that would, would then be, would work, would, you know, would be doing the things in the right way. Nothing really wrong with, with, the, with the institution so much as with the lack of wisdom and the selfishness and stupidity of people that are in them. And that includes us, too. We're talking about ourselves. <laughs> so, <laughs> not to put the blame on, on, the, on the politicians, uh, out there, but we can see if we if we don't put forth the effort to to understand, then how can we demand somebody else do it? How can we say, John Major, you should get enlightened, <laughs> so that you can make our institutions work better? Why don't you do it? <laughs> The aim of the, the the realization and the insight into these noble truths, then it, it is a lifetime uh, practice in this form, this human state. It's not suddenly so, get it, get it, and then you just kind of live in a state of rapture and bliss the rest of your life. But you realize that you're you're always dealing with with the Problems and difficulties of, uh, of your own karmic, of your own karma, and of the world around you. That life is like this. It's always, it's always difficult and problematic, and and it always hurts a bit, and, and it's never going to be, you know, uh, smooth sailing in a, in a state of bliss in this form, because this form doesn't allow for that. This human state. This, when you look at it, you, you see you're, you're in a in a vulnerable state. That it, it has a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. Just naturally a part of the of this karmic predicament. It's just the way it is. It's not not wrong. Not like it. There's something wrong about it, but it is something to to understand. And then in the in the, with ourselves, with the people we live with, we, we begin to, to accept things more and more. What they are, like, uh, trying to, wanting people to be something they're not. And that we, that I found a lot of suffering in monastic life when I wanted bhikkhus and nuns to be something that, that I didn't think they were not wanting them to be what I think they are. Thinking that I don't like you in this day, I want you to be something else. Or, you know, there's a, this, this way we, even out of good intentions, or wanting people to, to get enlightened, or to get out of their bad moods, or to be less selfish, and so forth, we can, we can really out of that sense of, of our own self-righteousness, we can be quite insensitive and, and see people only in terms of what we think they should be. 
and not fully accept them as they are. And accepting as as they are isn't approving. It's not 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 liking the way they are, but accepting. To accept something, then you, then, then you, you're not, it doesn't matter, it's not a matter of liking the way it is, but accepting it. And in that, then there is more possibility for change and, and for change in the right way. When people feel they're, they're accepted, and when you accept yourself, and not just hate yourself or criticize yourself because you're not what you think you should be, if you get caught into that, then then we we only become critics and, and complainers, grumblers about ourselves or about the world. And that is of no benefit to anyone. Just living with a group of people grumbling is, is hell, isn't it? Or you live with your own grumbling mind. I don't like this, I don't like that. And then you live with people around and they're grumbling about the weather, grumbling about this, grumbling about that. It's awful. You know, to, to, to just spend your time complaining. So in, uh, in, in, uh, understanding things as they are, we, we feel it and we, we accept the difficulties and the problems and the irritations, frustrations of, of this realm. And that means that we, that we don't suffer from it. We're, we're feeling it, but we don't create aversion. We don't hate it. We don't, uh, make a problem about it. Then when we, when we develop this, this more kind of meta-like attitude and, and more, uh, an acceptance of ourselves and others, and things do seem better. You understand things, you, you have insights, and people around you begin to, you know, you're, you're not reaffirming their own misery or their own inadequacy or, or you're not you're not kind of imposing, I'd like you better if you were somebody else, which is really quite cruel, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, I could, I'd, be, I'd like you a lot better if you were what I want you to be, is what we say. Or, or I don't like you the way you... I, mean, I remember we had this clear insight with Ajahn Chah because when he had his uh, stroke and he was... Uh, paralyzed for ten years before he died and uh, couldn't speak he was conscious and uh, and he uh, you know but he couldn't respond in any way he could kind of gaze at you stare at you with his eyes and he could wiggle his toes it was the only way you knew he was listening so so for ten years the monks took care of him till he died uh, last year and the uh, I remember when I heard this uh, that he'd had this stroke, and uh, it was about this time in uh, what ten or eleven years ago. And I, after the rains retreat, the Vasa Pansa, I went immediately to Thailand, to Bangkok, and he was in the Chulalongkorn Hospital, big hospital in in Bangkok, and. And uh, when I saw him in the wheelchair, you know, he's like a sack of flesh just sitting there like this, and he couldn't respond to anything. And you had to, they had to feed him and, and take care of him in every way. And of course, he would, he'd before been a very kind of, a very charming, uh, charismatic person. And uh, he was very lively, had great humor, and you loved being around him. You, you uh, people loved him. He was such a attractive and and uh, loving person. And then suddenly, you go look at this sack of flesh. It's not very attractive, and he's just sitting there drooling and can't do anything. And all you feel is this incredible sorrow. And then you then you can see yourself wanting 
I don't want you to be like this. I want you to be like you were. A feeling of, I don't like you like this. I want you to be the Ajahn Chah I used to know. And then you can kind, of, kind of contemplate this, you know, this, this, thing, this selfishness of, of uh, I don't like you sitting in this wheelchair, not being able to laugh or talk or entertain me and, and just sitting there like an idiot drooling on yourself. And it's disgusting. I don't like it. And you listen to, to this, you know, and, the, and you could see many people think, we've got to take him to this place for treatment, we've got to get him back so he's healthy again, and everybody kind of rushing around trying to, to you know, do things to, 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 so he would get back to the way we want him. But nothing, it became realized that there was nothing you could do. So then the insight was that one was grateful to that he was still alive and ex- and to to uh, express our love for him rather than expecting him to pop back into form and to please us which is a more mature kind of way of looking at it isn't it no, uh, where the childish one is I want you to you know I, I want you to you know to be the old charming teacher of you know, and you can sit around and talk and laugh and want to be entertained. I want that. And then, then we had to change. We had to give to him. We had to take care of all his needs, things like this. So it was like a, a growing up, something in you, no longer uh, would expect him to to do anything but just be there and one would do the best to take care of him, which is what happened. He lived ten years. I think anyone anyone else would have died much sooner, but he, he had such excellent care. <laughs> was the best in the world. And he had a, a very devoted, uh, I mean, people loved monks, really, really loved to take care of him. So there was always, there never any problem in getting monks to go and take care of him and, and that was a ongoing thing for ten years day and night he was never left alone ever he was I mean so when any anything happened like any any critical sign there there was always somebody around to do the right thing so that he, he wouldn't die but that insight was very meaningful to me to see the, the inner child or the, the baby or the, the one you know the, I don't want you like this I want you to be the Lumpo I used to know and then you realize they can't do that anymore it's your turn now to, to do the right things and one thing we can do is love people it's not you know a sense of love not in in uh, in it's uh like infatuation or a way of liking, but in accepting people as a way of loving them, isn't it? Even though they might be pretty awful or pretty impossible uh, or difficult, uh, hating them for being that way is of no use to anyone, isn't it? It eats away, eats you up, and it and it also makes them just. It doesn't help them, people that you you're trying to that you don't like so in the ultimate it gets down to being just having a lot of faith and and awareness trust in the goodness of your own intention for your life make your intention for your life a perfect one and this is what I find very helpful like you can do this quite intentionally in a rational way never do it when you're emotionally high when you're just like this kind of ordinary not not high as a kite or not too low but just ordinary where you're cool in a state of cool calm collectiveness you can say my intention is to 
be free from all delusions and to realize the ultimate reality. Now that's, now, now that is uh, what I advise you to do, to make that intention. My intention for my life is to be free from all delusion and realize the deathless ultimate reality. Then your emotions might say, well, and you think you can really do that? <laughs> Isn't that a bit over the top? Or, you know, or the, the emotions will go on like that. But this is, this is how to use your mind so that you're, you know, this isn't, this isn't overestimating anything or, or is, or is proclaiming yourself as, you know, special being is going to, to, to have some special realization. This is our right as human beings. This is, this is our, this is the, this is, um, what we can do as human beings. This is what being human is about. We can, we can intend, we can make that our pure intention, perfect intention. I can't think of a better intention for life than that. But that's made on the, on the rational, it's a rational intention. Isn't it? chosen deliberately then from that then we we can uh, observe our own emotional feelings about I can't do it or it's you know I've got too many problems I'm too screwed up by uh, this is being ridiculous and the, the way the negative or a reaction will come just listen to that accept that also but don't don't believe that's not your intention. Your intention you've made, and 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 that is like a guiding star, it's like to to keep you. If you have a, you know, in the dark, you need you need to look at something above you that that you that can guide you. So that's like that's above you. That that's guiding you. That's what you you must look towards and remind yourself of. But you also need to know where you are, so you don't break your leg or fall into the ditch. You're just looking up at the stars and walking along, you probably walk off a cliff. So so you need both. So you need to be know where you are and you also need to keep your direction. So so that that, that ability to intend to make the perfect intention is your direction. And then like for bickers when we ordain it it's always to realize the deathless reality. When, when the purpose and aim of the monastic life, the bhikkhu monastic life, is 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 that perfect intention, and so then then the, then the developing the path is learning to deal with the things that in the way, the way things are, the the problems, the obstacles, the 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 things that disrupt you, distract you, delude you. But you, you also can keep your direction because you, you need to re- keep that, the, that, uh, to remember what your, your intention is. And to keep that, and to trust in that. Pure intention. And then you, then you can deal with, with the problems and difficulties of daily life and the, and the, and your own karmic tendencies and the frustrations and uh, exasperations of living with families and working and what not. None of those are obstacles to enlightenment. The only obstacle to enlightenment is, is your own ignorance and grasping of things. So, so then the <laughs> enlightenment isn't something that's way beyond you and you can't do and it's just uh, because if you start thinking like that then that's the way your life is going to be if you believe that then you'll end up like that uh, because you, you kind of have already made your determination to be unenlightened to be someone who can't do things but, but so if you're going to determine, determine the perfect, make the perfect determination. Because we can, we can deliberately choose that. 
It doesn't matter whether you think you can do it or not. That's not the point. The point is you do it, you make it, and then you can observe. You learn from your own feelings about your own inabilities or whatever. We need to to accept that side of ourself too, but not believe it. And by willingness to understand and accept that side, we, we're, we're releasing it, we're letting it go. And more and more we, we find our our goal and our reality and our present reality synchronized, integrated. And then we realize death once dead, there's no more dying then. Die before you die. And I imagine when I predict the future and I see I think if you keep Contemplating and 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 uh, the four noble truths till it's time to die, then death would be quite a pleasant experience. I should think I'm quite looking forward to it. Let go of this thing. You know, just it's wearing out. Got a few years left. You can still when it's time to. To die, then you, you know, you're letting go of something that that uh, that is not yours anyway, and needs to. And, you know, it's kind of it's finished, but it's certainly not nothing to to be frightened of or to uh, feel that that there's anything wrong with it, because you know that that. Uh, all that dies is what was born and it's just the elements in the conditioned realm arising and ceasing. And this, of course, is in meditation is, is, a, is to, we can understand the words and the, appreciate the, the meaning of it, but the, the realization is also possible, the real, the insight into this, into the true Dhamma is possible and the, the right of every human being. I, I make the assumption that we all have that right. Because it's better to assume that than to assume that we, that some people don't. Sankamayan, <laughs> <laughs>